Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Dave Olszewski. I am the associate pastor here at Risen Church, and it's my privilege to uh, get to bring the Word of God to you this morning. Uh, last week, John kicked us off in our series in Colossians called Firmly Established. So this week, we're going to move on to Colossians 1, and we'll start in verse 15 and go through verse 20. But before we do, uh, you know, I love YouTube. YouTube can be like an endless hole, and you end up wasting a whole day, right? But it can be constructive. It can be. And uh, you can go on YouTube and see all kinds of things. Like when my car breaks down, I go on there, and instead of going to a mechanic, I can try to fix myself. And then when I can't fix it myself, then I spend that money, and I spend the money going to the mechanic. So that works out really well. Uh, but there's all kinds of good stuff on there, right? There are also these videos where uh, somebody with a camera and a mic goes out on the street and asks people questions, like random people. You know, do you know your American history? And they find somebody and they're like, who was the first president? And they're like, uh, I don't know, Saddam Hussein? And, and everybody laughs, right? That's not correct. That is true. That is not correct. Um, he's the second one, yeah. Right after John Adams, I think. Uh, anyway, so those videos are interesting to watch because it's interesting to see what people's opinions are. Right? So what if you did a video, what if you took a camera and a mic and you went out on the street and you asked people, who is Jesus? Who do you think Jesus is? What might be some of the answers that you hear? Well, you'd probably get, well, I think he was like one of many prophets, you know, like Muhammad. He was kind of like a prophet. Uh, maybe he was just a good teacher. Like, I, I feel like he has some good things to say. Or maybe he was an inspirational person. He probably, you'd probably get the answer, well, he, you know, he was a famous dude, right? He was famous enough that we changed our calendar, you know. Beyond that, I'm not really sure. Uh, you might get the answer, I've heard this answer, that Jesus didn't exist, right? He was actually plagiarized from an Egyptian god myth. Somebody took that and they were like, well, let's just change that. And well, I, that was Jesus, right? So he didn't actually exist, it was just a myth. Or you might get an answer like, well, I think Jesus is like, he's like a baby, like he's Christmas baby Jesus. He's just laying there in his little golden fleece diapers, right? Or you might be like, well, my Jesus wears a tuxedo t-shirt. He's got a mullet. Because, like, he wants to be formal, but he's here to party. Or my Jesus, the Jesus I pray to, is like a figure skater, and he does interpretive dances of my life's journey. Wow. Yeah. So with all these opinions, right, you're going to get, if you surveyed 100 people, you're probably going to get 50 different opinions. So the question is, can we really know who Jesus is? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. That's why I've entitled the sermon, Who is Jesus? So last week we saw that Paul described the Colossian church as having been rescued from hopeless darkness and transferred into God's kingdom of light, having been made permanent members of God's eternal family. As members of God's family, he calls them to live a certain way. In other words, their new identity in Christ informs how and why they do everything. This is summed up in what we've designated as the key text of our series, and that's Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. It says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So let's go on now and read Colossians 1, 15 through 20. And keep in mind that in verses 12 through 14, we see that the Father saves people through Jesus and establishes them in the kingdom of Jesus. So the first he, in verse 15, is talking about Jesus. So here we go, Colossians 1. 15 through 20. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Man, what a beautiful section of scripture, right? This is a feast. This is a gospel feast here. So the big idea that I want to look at today, the overarching big idea is Jesus is the reason for your existence. Jesus is the reason for your existence. And I'm actually going to use three words out of that to structure our time together this morning. So we'll look at Jesus first, then we'll look at reason, and then we'll look at existence. Okay, so first up, who is Jesus? So to see this, let's go back and dissect verses 15 through 20 and see what this is really saying. What is the picture that Paul is painting of Jesus here? So verse 15, the first half, it says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So let's focus on two words, image and invisible. So image in the Greek is actually a word, uh, the word is icon. And from that, we get the English word icon. Icon means copy or likeness. And we see this truth elsewhere. Uh, so let's go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, verse 3. And just as a warning, uh, this is going to be like a big Bible drill this morning, okay? I hope you're not, I hope you're more interested in what the Bible says than what I have to say, because that's my approach, okay? So we're going to be all over the place. It's going to be awesome. All right, Hebrews 1, 3. It says, he, speaking of Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So there we see the word icon. He's the exact imprint or the exact copy of the Father. Jesus is exactly the same as the Father in substance. Okay? But that brings us to the second word. Paul uses, he is the image of the invisible God here. So why does he bring that up? That's because Jesus differs in person and role in the Trinity. So Jesus is the visible, tangible person of the Trinity. We see this in John 1, verse 18. John 1, 18 says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So again, see what that's saying. It's saying no one has ever seen God the Father. And then it says, the only God, which God is that? The one at the Father's side. So that's speaking of Jesus. Jesus has made the Father known because he is the visible, tangible person of the Trinity. It says the same thing in 1 John 1. 1 John 1, the first two verses. John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Okay, moving on, uh, let's look at the second half of verse 15. It says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Now, you might be tempted to think, wait a minute, Jesus was, he was firstborn. Does that mean he's created? Well, we'll get to that. Okay, that's in the next verse. That's in verse 16. But what firstborn is referring to here is the right of a firstborn son to an inheritance. How do we know this? Well, let's go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, verse 2. It says, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things. So there we see the inheritance aspect. It's harmonized in Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verses 6 through 8. It says, As for me... I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. 
The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So we see there that Psalm 2 is a conversation between the father and the son. The father's promising that the ends of the earth will be the possession of Jesus. So you might ask, has that happened? Well, let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 18. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So that is true now. All right, back to Colossians, verse 16. It says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, I was looking at this week, and I poured all my associate pastor powers into trying to figure out what this verse says. And here is my conclusion. Jesus created all things. Huh? Pretty good, huh? Yeah. Where did I get that? Well, it says the same thing twice, right? For by him all things were created. Black and white. And then at the end of the verse, all things were created through him and for him. But just in case you're like, eh, I don't know. Your logic seems a little iffy. Let's go back to, to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So here we see it's not just that Jesus created everything. He is preserving and upholding everything simply by the word of his power. That's amazing. All right, back to Colossians. Let's look at verses 17 and 18. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And you see that last word preeminent, that's a big $5 word that really means first in everything, above all things. So in these two verses, what we're really seeing is that the rule and supremacy of Jesus over creation is connected to the fact that he created everything. So because he created everything, he rules over everything and is supreme. Uh, turn to Nehemiah 9.6. Nehemiah 9.6. You are the Lord. You alone. That's pretty plain. Why, though? It lists the reasons. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. And one more, just because it's such a cool passage, go to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll go uh, with verses 19 through 23. Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. It says, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Right? There's a no doubter. He's above everything, and he goes to great lengths to name all the things that he's above, and then he goes to great lengths to describe all the things that are below him. Okay? So there's no doubt that Christ rules and is supreme. All right, last two verses, verses 19 and 20. It says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth 
or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. There's two things we need to draw out of this. The first one is that Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God. This is repeated later on in Colossians because it's so important. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Okay, so Jesus is God. The second thing we see is God in Christ reconciles the world to himself. God in Christ reconciles the world to himself. In Romans 5.1 it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God, how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, back to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verses 7 through 10. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. All right? So that is the picture of who Jesus is. This is the picture that Paul paints and that other scripture harmonizes. So if this is who Jesus is, then it must mean something about who we are as human beings, right? It's got to say something about who we are as human beings. And there's something that we as humans have in common. It doesn't matter where you're born, when you're born, there are some fundamental questions that we usually end up asking at some point in our life, like, how did I get here? Why am I here? And what is my purpose in life, right? I have a dog. My dog has never pondered his existence, right? He's just a dog. He thinks about dog things. He doesn't question his dogness, right? But we ask, how, how did I get here? Why am I here? Now, there are many answers out there, right? We could probably do another video on YouTube about this. So what about the how? How did I get here? Well, our scientifically advanced culture gives us this answer. Uh, you got here by a succession of random, spontaneous, and accidental events. The first life uh, just somehow kind of happened, and then billions of years later, you just uh, kind of happened, and we don't really know why any of it happened. Well, that's hopeful. Okay, but what about the why? What about the purpose part, right? Ours is a culture that proclaims you are your own person. You are your own person. Follow your heart. You can be anything you want to if you set your mind to it. It's up to you to discover yourself, to find meaning in your life, and to express yourself however you want to. Feelings determine reality. Feelings create meaning. And you deserve affirmation and validation from others. Does that sound familiar? Now, there's a poem uh, by the name of Invictus. It was written by William Henley. And it perfectly captures this prevailing attitude, right? Invictus is a Latin word meaning unconquerable or undefeated. And it concludes by saying, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now, what's interesting to me, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make this like schadenfreude where I'm like celebrating someone else's misfortune, but Henley was actually facing health issues when he wrote this poem, uh, part of which was the amputation of one of his legs. So he... Get this picture, right? He's about to have his leg hacked off, and he's proclaiming that he's unconquerable. So in my crazy mind, I was like, wait a minute, I've seen that in a movie. That's in Monty Python, Holy Grail, right? You know that one knight who has 
both arms and both legs hacked off, and he's sitting on the ground, like still mouthing off to the guy, like, it's a flesh wound, come and fight me, right? <laughs> That's the, isn't that ridiculous? It's ridiculous because this attitude of pride in clear defeat is ridiculous, and yet that's the picture that our culture puts forth. Here's the glaring problem. Here's the glaring problem for us if we believe that we are our own. The problem is that none of us can bear the crushing weight of trying to justify our existence. We can't bear the weight of trying to make our life truly meaningful. I recently read a book by Alan Noble, and I pulled this quote out of it. Uh, I wanted to make it shorter, but it's such, it's such a good quote that I, I had to do the whole thing. So here we go. This is his amazing description of our culture. He writes, justifying your existence is not a definitive action. It is an ongoing process. You're always journeying and never arriving. If you're responsible for meaning in your life, you can never cease the labor of creating and sustaining moments of significance. If you're responsible for defining and expressing your identity, you can never cease expressing, never cease discovering and fine-tuning your identity. Because your personhood is irreducibly complex, there is never an end to your searching. If you are your own, you can never stop evolving and progressing and perfecting yourself through technique. If you are your own and belong to yourself, you belong nowhere and everywhere at once. You will perpetually struggle between your autonomy and the desire to surrender to a larger community of belonging. Resignation is the natural posture of a people with no ultimate ends to pursue. I had to take a deep breath after I read that for the first time. That is sobering, isn't it? So what, what kind of art does a culture like this produce? A culture that's lonely and frustrated and restless? Well, we can look to the uh, cultural icons Black Sabbath. They wrote a little ditty called Paranoid here are some of the lyrics. Finished, I'm not going to sing. I know you're like, hey, aren't you the singing guy? No. <laughs> I don't have a good Aussie impression, so I'm not going to sing it. It says, finished with my woman because she couldn't help me with my mind. People think I'm insane because I'm frowning all the time. All day long, I think of things, but nothing seems to satisfy. Think I'll lose my mind if I don't find something to pacify. Can you help me? occupy my brain. I need someone to show me the things in life that I can't find. I can't see the things that make true happiness. I must be blind. This is the fruit of championing human autonomy and human supremacy in a purposeless universe. And again, the unified message is you are your own person. Now, that was pretty depressing. Right? I got a little sadder myself, and I prepared that, right? So there's got to be a different message, right? There's got to be a different answer for those questions. And it turns out there's one answer. And the answer is, Jesus is the reason for your existence. So that brings us to our second section here, where we're going to look at to the two parts of this. One, how we exist, and two, why we exist. And again, this is grounded in Colossians 1, verse 16. So how we exist. For by him, all things were created. It's that simple. We exist because of Jesus. There's a reason that the Bible repeatedly reminds us in the Old and New Testaments that God is creator. Everywhere you read in the Bible, there are reminders. Hey, Remember, God created everything. If it's over and over, that is for a purpose, right? Not only that, but the very first truth. So the Bible is God's special revelation to us, right? So what is the first thing, the first truth that he chooses to tell us? 
that God created the heavens and the earth. That's what he started with. It's so important, okay? So that's the how we exist. Now, why do we exist? What is the purpose for our existence? Well, there's, there's telos in creation. Telos is a Greek word that points to purpose or an end goal. So Jesus, as creator, made everything with telos. Now, you may have noticed that a lot of the war going on in our culture is about language, right? It has surrounds language and definitions and naming. The hope is that if we can change the definition of something, we can simultaneously change its purpose, goal, or moral acceptability. The problem is definitions are inherent in God's creation. Remember what we've read in Colossians. If Jesus is supreme over everything and has created everything with a definite purpose in mind, then Jesus alone, Jesus exclusively possesses the right to define everything in creation. Here are some examples. Jesus alone creates and defines what a man is and what his purpose is. Jesus alone creates and defines what a woman is and what her purpose is, what marriage is and the purpose of marriage, what a husband is and what he does, what a father is and what he does, what a wife is and what she does, what a mother is and what she does, what sex is and its purpose, what a household is and its purpose, what the church is and its purpose, what good law is and the purposes of good laws, what is truth and what is good, period. And finally, Jesus alone creates and defines what is uh, the value of all human lives, both born and unborn. Now notice, we try to change these definitions, right? But what are we doing? We're trying to take something that God created as constructive and fruitful, and we end up turning it into something that causes destruction and death. Why is that? Well, it's because when God has defined something and we attempt to redefine it, we're actually calling God a liar. We're saying, you know, uh, good effort, but you missed the mark. Remember who Jesus is, right? We have to remember who Jesus is so we don't say really stupid things like that, okay? If Jesus has defined something, that has to be good enough for us. Okay, so that's definitions. But I also mentioned naming. So how does naming uh, enter into this? Well, we see in Genesis 2, if you remember the story, in Genesis 2, God brought all the animals to Adam to see what he would name them. So why was that? Was God like, ugh, I just did all this stuff, and I don't really feel like doing this, so I'm just going to delegate it because I need to go rest, right? No, that is not why he did that. Naming is actually God's instrument through which we can understand God's purpose and goal, right? So the, the hope is that if you name your child something, that is your goal for him or her, or the end purpose that you're hoping for, right? Uh, there's a fantastic book called The Things of Earth. I encourage you to check it out, The Things of Earth. And author Joe Rigney uh, says this about naming. He writes, naming involves God's design, purpose, and intent in creation on the one hand, as well as man's recognition of God's design, an advancement of God's reign through his act of naming on the other. So do you see how this synthesizes God's purpose and our recognition of his purpose in naming, right? Now, it's not over. Yes, Adam named everything, but the naming has not stopped. As God's kingdom advances on the earth and he saves people, he continues to name. Look at Revelation 3, Verse 12, this is Jesus speaking. Revelation 3, verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. 
never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. So what's the picture here? The picture here is all of God's people are all tatted up with these names on them, right? <laughs> I can tell how some of you feel about tattoos. But I'm just reading scripture, so. Mm. All right? But what's the point? He gives us his name. He gives us his name so that we know what he's doing and we know what to do from there. All right? You might still be saying, well, why, do, why does Jesus have to put his name on people? That's a little weird, isn't it? Well, my sons were in Little League for, for a second. And if you go into, like, a Little League bullpen, there's just crap everywhere, right? And part of the fun after the game is figuring out whose stuff it belongs to who, right? So why do kids put their name on their bat and glove and backpack in Little League? Well, it's to designate what belongs to them. What is their possession? Why do I use the word possession and belong? Well, let's go to 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. I use it because God uses this language. So 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. There's that possession language again. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So where is this leading us logically, right? If Jesus is fully God, if he's supreme over everything, he's created everything with purpose and definition, then it stands to follow that his lordship puts requirements on how we should live. So that brings us to our third section here. Jesus is the reason for your existence. Now, About 500 years ago, a bunch of old Christians got together and they put together what is known as the Heidelberg Catechism. So do you know what the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism is? first question, again, the first question, what is your only comfort in life and death? What is your only comfort in life and death? That begs the question, do we need comfort? Well, the question assumes that, right? So then the question is, why? Why do we need comfort? I think it's obvious that we acknowledge our need for comfort in our constant search for comfort, right? Life is challenging and disappointing in many, many ways. I don't have to tell you that. But because of that, we seek comfort constantly. The search for comfort is embodied in the popularity of self-medicating, right? We, we medicate ourselves. We're looking for coping mechanisms. We're looking for ways to uh, escape our reality. This is seen in the use of antidepressants and alcohol and drugs and social media and video games and virtual reality. Did you ever think about that? Virtual reality. Reality shows, TV binge watching, and the list goes on and on right? We look for comfort. We look for ways to escape. But this is saying, this question is intentionally worded. It's not saying, what is the best comfort? What's one of the top comforts on the list of comforts? It's saying, what is your only comfort in life and death? That's a pretty bold question, right? So what's the, what's the answer? The first part of it, that I am not my own. That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That sounds like the exact opposite of what our culture tells us, right? Remember, you are your own person, and now we're saying, wait a minute. I'm comforted by the fact that I'm not my own? 
Where's this coming from? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Similarly, in Romans 14, 8, <clears throat> Romans 14, 8, the second half says, Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Now, admittedly, there's probably some of you that are a little scared of the idea that you would not be your own. So where would this anxiety be coming from? Well, honestly, because we're human and we're familiar with instances of abuse, right? In abuse, the abuser essentially gets the other person to believe that they are not their own, right? Alan Noble, again, I got this quote from Alan Noble. He says, every abuse of authority involves an authority figure who desi uh, desires his or her own good at the expense of others. That's what's going on there. And that's why we're rightly a little af afraid of the idea that we might not be our own. So how do we get to the place where it is our only comfort? We have to go to Jesus. Because remember, we haven't forgotten who Jesus is. Jesus is not an abuser. Jesus is not abusive. He's wonderful counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting father, and he's prince of peace. Now, he could have been uh, justified in giving us all these commands from heaven because he rules and is supreme. But it's even more amazing to understand who Jesus is because of the incarnation. Look at this. Uh, look at these verses in John 13. It's such a beautiful picture because it combines what we've seen in Colossians with his humble incarnation. John 13, 3 through 5. It says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. That's the Colossians part. Do you recognize it? So what did he do? He didn't get senioritis, right? He wasn't like, well, I've done pretty good. I think I'll just, you know, cruise the rest of the way. No, he used the fullness of his deity in bodily form to serve others. It's ridiculous. So once he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This is the supreme God of the universe washing normal dudes' nasty feet. Can you comprehend that? Compare it to what the things that we complain about, right? Gosh, it's so ridiculous. It's so good. So where does this get us? It gets us to Belonging to Jesus is how we can be the most human. Just like an abusive relationship dehumanizes, the perfect relationship with Jesus fully humanizes. We were created in God's image to experience union with him. And that word union is very important. It's not association. It's union. The second thing is because I am not my own, my identity, value, satisfaction, hope, and purpose are eternally secure in Christ. That is good news. That's good news in a, in a culture that they don't have any of that. Next thing 
is I don't have to save the world. I don't have to save the world. I can just joyfully obey and trust Jesus with the rest. Isn't that freeing? Compare that to the false freedom that our culture says, well, you know, absolute freedom is the best. And then you're like out there floating tied to nothing with no purpose. And you're like, uh, I don't think I want absolute freedom. And Jesus is like, you never had it anyway, right? And that's freeing. That's rest. That's peace. All right, next thing. If Christ's name is on me, I don't have to make a name for myself. If Christ's name is on me, I don't have to make a name for myself. Because I belong to Jesus, I am never alone. Because his spirit dwells within me. And the last thing, because I belong to Jesus, I know what to do. I know how to do it. And I know why I do it. How do we get there? Because Jesus told us. Jesus showed us, and then he gave us his Holy Spirit, right? He gave us everything we need. Now, the end of that catechism answer is, therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. That's some really interesting wording. Makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. That sounds like joy and thanksgiving. All right, so what does it look like? Let's put some flesh on this. How do we get to the place where we can say, where we are saying, I am not my own, I belong to Christ, and that is my only comfort? I got four things, four things for you. It's recognize, obey, clear the land, and bear fruit. Okay, so first one, recognize. If you look at the etymology of recognize, and etymology is like looking at the origins of words and the roots and the meanings, right? So you can really understand where a word came from and what it's built with. Uh, recognize means to know again. To know again. And John actually talked about this a lot last week in his emphasis on prayer and thanksgiving. In prayer and thanksgiving, uh, we know again that we belong to Christ. We recognize our need. We know again our need. We recognize both God's ability and his desire to provide our needs. We need to be reminded of that. And finally, we recognize or we know again that God has provided. Therefore, we always have something to be thankful for. Recognizing is so important. It lays the foundation for all of these other things. Okay, so the second thing is obey. Specifically, obey Christ's commandments. Wait, commandments? I thought we were in the new covenant. I thought this was like relationship and not rules. Like that's Old Testament stuff, right? Like those crazy Israelites who were so stubborn out in the wilderness. God had to give them those rules because they were so terrible. God isn't asking us to do anything that he himself hasn't done, right? We see this again in Jesus. Go to John 14. It doesn't get any clearer than this. John 14, verse 31. This is Jesus speaking. But I do as the Father has commanded me. I do as the Father has commanded me. Does that blow your mind? That the second person of the Trinity, who is fully God, willingly took commands from someone who was his equal? Why, though? Why? Let's keep reading. He says, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Because the love exists, the desire to obey exists. We get into big trouble when we start to separate God's commands from God's love. That's where we get legalism. 
That's where we get antinomianism. That's a big $5 word that means I don't think I have to follow the law, okay? Because every time we separate God's love from God's commands, we get into trouble. Okay, so that's recognize, that's obey, and now number three, clear the land. What in the world am I talking about there? Well, I'm talking about our lifelong sanctification. And I'm going to go to the illustration of the Israelites as they were preparing to go into the promised land. Remember that God, in his power, monergistically, or by himself, saved them out of Egypt, right? They had nothing to do with their own salvation. Then he wandered them around in the desert, preparing them for this promised land, okay? Now, God had the power, just like he had the power to save them out of Egypt, he also had the power to clear out all of the sinful people from the promised land. Did you ever think about this? He could have removed all the sinful people and been like, there you go, Israelites. Build houses, have fun, it's all yours, right? Why did he choose not to remove all those sinful people from the promised land? Because God wanted them to experience his goodness through the hard work and obedience of purifying the promised land. I see that as an amazing metaphor for what he calls us to in obedience in sanctification, right? And remember this, God knew that it wouldn't take them about 35 minutes to conquer the promised land, right? He knew it was going to take a long time time and that was part of his plan the same thing goes for our sanctification he knows it's a lifelong process it's not going to be a switch flip and it's all great right Uh, god has the power to instantly remove our sinful desires he does and he can and sometimes he does but most of the time he doesn't and that is for our good because Ours is a battle of old self, new self. And you'll see that language in Colossians as we go through it, right? Old self, new self, flesh, spirit. All of these, our old self, our flesh has been crucified with Christ on the cross. It's dead, but it's still hanging around, and we have the tendency to think about it and fantasize about it being not dead, right? It's like we're picturing a zombie as somebody beautiful. It's, it's really dumb and weird, right? But that's a picture of our sin. Now, the illustration I thought of for sanctification uh, has to do with like a Buffalo Wild Wings type place or Bubba's 33 if you've been in there. It's a place where uh, as you're eating your chicken and drinking your beer, there's like uh, 1,032 screens, right? You're just like, uh, I can't focus because there's so much to look at, right? Now picture, if Jesus is the screen in front of you, How much harder is it to focus on that screen when these other 87 screens are on, right? Because even though you can see Jesus, it's like, uh, I mean, that looks looks better right now, but oh, I know I need to look at Jesus. Oh, that looks really good over there, right? So our sanctification looks like the fight to get the other screens turned off in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Sometimes God in his mercy will just turn off TVs for us, right? but he understands that we grow in our trust and love for him as we fight to turn off those TVs, right? And there is hope. There is hope that it does get easier, right? I call it spiritual momentum, right? You can get to the point where the Jesus screen is on, right? There's still screens on back here, but it takes way more effort for me to like turn around and look at them. It's so much easier to focus on Jesus the more consistently we fight against our sins. I hope that's encouraging for you. So clearing the land, again, it's not something that we thought up. We are, again, following the example of Jesus. What did he do? He denied himself, or he died to himself, and he killed sin. Uh, Now, I got a CrossFit dad joke for this one. You ready? Denying yourself and killing sin is true CrossFit training. Uh, There you go. All right. 
Denying yourself and killing sin, that was way funnier in my study at home. Uh, denying yourself and killing sin is true CrossFit training. Turn to Titus 2, Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now, here's a bonus one. Jesus promises comfort in him. That is true. Jesus promises comfort in him, but he doesn't promise that you'll be comfortable. Do you see the difference? Jesus promises comfort in him, but he does not promise that you'll be comfortable. Where do I get this from? Hebrews 5, 8. Jesus wasn't comfortable either, and it was good. Hebrews 5, 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And if you turn to John 16, 33, we see both of these things in view. We see comfort in, in view, and we see uncomfortable in view. John 16, 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace, comfort. In the world you will have tribulation, uncomfortable, right? But take heart, comfort. I have overcome the world, comfort. All right, so that's the first three. So we recognize, we obey, we clear the land, and finally we bear fruit. We bear fruit on the vine. Capital V, vine. All right, so because we are not our own, we as the church, the body of Christ, view the time, talents, and treasure Jesus gives us as gifts to be used in service of him. Through these gifts, this is the miracle of it, through these gifts, God chooses to meet the physical and spiritual needs of others. Isn't that amazing? You can flip burgers, and God uses that to advance the kingdom. That's the exponential factor of kingdom living. And this also continues the expansion of his government on the earth that Isaiah 9 talks about. Now, this, this might be weird to you, but hang with me. Uh, because we belong to Christ, we subsequent, subsequently, that's an easy word to say, subsequently belong to other people, okay? We don't belong to other people in the same way that we belong to Christ, but we belong to other people in the way of obligations. So what am I talking about? Family. You are not your own, so serve your family. If you've been given a wife, serve her. If you've been given kids, serve her according to the word of God. If you've been given parents, which is, if you're sitting here, you have parents, right? Or if you don't have parents that are still living and you don't have a spouse and you don't have kids, guess what? You can find all of those in the church, right? The Bible talks about us having spiritual fathers and mothers, and spiritual children. So that's available in the church, which is the second one. You are not your own because you're a part of the body of Christ on the earth. So our priority should be serving his church. And the last place is our community or the place where we live. You might think, well, I, you know, I looked at houses and then I made the choice. And God's like, uh, that's nice, but you didn't, right? Acts 17, 26 says that God has determined the allotted periods of our lives and the boundaries of our dwelling place. So, if he has put us in this time, in this place, again, it's not an accident. There's telos there. There's purpose. There's an end goal there. So, where you live should be an outpost of the gospel as you serve other people. Okay? So, we have an obligation to our family our church, and our community. So this morning we looked at the fact that Jesus is the reason
for our existence and that we are not our own. Jesus is God, and he rules as supreme over everything and everyone. And if we belong to him, if you belong to him, you are secure, protected, and provided for. Jesus is also the Savior, Redeemer, and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So if you belong to him, you are truly a new creation in him and an eternal member of his family. Jesus created us in his image to walk as he walked. It's not up to us to figure it out. We just look at Jesus. And if you belong to him, you joyfully obey him. You serve our Heavenly Father by sacrificing for others. Praise God that because of Christ, our only comfort is that we are not our own. Let's pray. Thank you.